Welcome to Sex Care is Self-Care, a conversation on women's sexual health brought to you by the Patty Brisbane Foundation for Women's Sexual Health. I'm your host, Patty Brisbane. Today, Dr. Vaccaro, a member of our PBF Medical Advisory Board, is with us to talk about this very serious problem, female genital mutilation. This is going to be one of the harder discussions but it's one of our most important ones. Dr. Vercaro, for those who might not have tuned in before, can you give our listeners and tell them a little bit about yourself? Yes, thanks, Patty. Um, My name is Dr. Christine Vercaro, and I'm fellowship trained and double board certified in female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery, as well as obstetrics and gynecology. I'm also the fellowship director for female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery and an associate professor of obstetrics and gynecology in Bethesda, Maryland. Thank you so much. Um, well, let's let's start off with um, what is female genital mutilation and why is this an important topic today? Awesome. And thanks, Patty, for, um, for doing this as a podcast. I think this is another area that doesn't get enough attention um, because it is so distressing. So um, I wanna identify female genital mutilation by its other names. It's also called female circumcision or female genital cutting, but the term female genital mutilation really encompasses all the various types of this harmful practice. This practice involves the partial or total removal of external female genitalia, traditionally the, the clitoris and the glands, and it can also include other injury to other genital organs for, and this is all for non-medical reasons. So these various cutting procedures to the vulva um, include removing the clitoral hood or the glands, removing all or parts of the labia, sewing the labia shut, um, which leaves only a small hole for urination and menstruation as well as intercourse, which is then very painful. And as one would expect, this results in very low libido, um, difficulty with orgasm and sexual pain. And then related to childbirth, usually the labia has, to, if, if they did have the procedure where the labia are sewn together, then the labia must be open to allow for vaginal childbirth. And in the countries where this is still performed traditionally, then the labia is sewn shut again. We still know very little um, regarding sexual function related to female genital cutting and mutilation. And we still don't know that much about how reversal influences or affects sexual function that we do. We do have some data that I'll review later. But the, the bottom line is this has no health benefit um, and it can cause serious health implications, um, including severe bleeding, which can actually lead to death problems urinating. Um, sometimes the areas that were cut form these large cysts Um, They can get infections, there's lots of complications seen during childbirth, and there's increased risk of newborn death. Um, So female genital mutilation is basically, it is a a violation of human rights. It is a form of gender-based violence, and it's a form of child abuse in girls and women. Um, It involves removing and damaging healthy and normal female genital tissues and it interferes with the natural natural function of girls and women's bodies. So I'm sure that many of our listeners are out there right now saying, well, I don't know of anybody that this has happened to. So I'm gonna ask you, how common is this? And around the world, more than 200 million girls and women alive today have been cut in 30 different countries. Again, mostly this is Sub-Saharan Africa, um, the Middle East and Asia, where this this practice is still mostly concentrated. And I wanna be clear that this is usually done on very young girls, anywhere from infancy to age 15. Um, And although it's still common in some countries, there have been great international efforts to end this practice, which have resulted in drastic decreases These efforts started in 1997 when the World Health Organization joined UNICEF and um, the United Nations Children's Fund to work with communities to change public policy, revising legal frameworks, and this made it illegal in 26 countries as well as 33 other countries where these migrant populations may go to. So this international response continues to strengthen the healthcare sector 
with education, advocacy, and increasing evidence. Um, but still, it's extremely common, and we'll get to it. It's, it also happens here in the United States. Can you explain the different types of FGM uh, for the listeners, for all of us? So there are four main types, three of which involve various cutting procedures and then of the vulva, and then one additional type that includes other harmful procedures um, to the female genitals, such as pricking and piercing. So type one is partial or total removal of the clitoral gland. Um, this may also involve removal of the clitoral hood, which just is the fold of skin over the glands. And this is probably one of the most commonly performed. Type two is the partial or total removal of the glands plus the labia minora, which are the inner folds of the vulva. Um, and this is with or without removal of the, the labia majora, which are the larger um, skin folds of the vulva. Type three is also known as infibulation, which is type one and type two together, plus they close the vagina by, by sewing um, the labia over the vagina, creating a very small hole again for urination, menstruation, and intercourse. Um, and this you know, can also be done with or without removal of the clitoral hoods or glands. So it can be done in with that or it can be done separately. And the last type um, basically is actually relatively new. At, at one point, there are only three types and they added in this fourth type not too long ago to incorporate all other harmful procedures to the female genitalia for non-medical purposes. Again, this is pricking, piercing, incising, scraping, or even cauterizing the genitals. Um, so that, that got wrapped up in a fourth type. This is uh, so hard to hear. I know. It's, it's hard to even say it. I know. Um, and it's really hard to believe that this is happening right now. And it's happening in the U.S. It could be happening on someone's kitchen table as we speak or someone's backyard. Um, <sighs> yeah. So... The, the good news is that there's federal laws that make it illegal in the United States. Um, and if this were to occur and, and be punishable, it's punishable up to five years in prison fines or both. Um, there's no exception for performing this because of a tradition or a culture. Um, so there's, there's no recourse. If it happened, it's, it is punishable. Um, but more recently, there's been news articles highlighting cases of girls born in the U.S. Um, and then being subjected to female genital mutilation while on vacation in their parents' countries of origin. This is referred to as vacation cutting. Um, and another federal law was made in 2013 to make this practice also illegal. Um, so it's illegal to knowingly transport a girl out of the United States just for the purpose of female genital mutilation or for if that were to occur while she was on vacation. But Patty, as you said, this still does occur in the United States. And despite these federal laws, the practice, um, according to the CDC in 2012, approximately and a little over 500,000 girls have had the procedure or were at risk of having the procedure in our very country. Yeah, I've, I've heard, listened and heard of these statistics and it's just so hard to believe, but when people are coming in from other countries, they're also bringing their beliefs with them. And grandma has had it, mother has had it. Um, and so therefore it becomes like a, a, a religious or belief and I just this is just hard to hear and I'm so glad that the we've taken on this focus because no one no matter if it's just U.S. but around the world this should not be happening um there's a tough balance here for some and how do you balance this religious and cultural consideration considerations versus the effects on the FGM. Yeah, I think 
This is really difficult to negotiate um, because there's so many emotions involved um, with the families and the culture and the tradition. Um, but just to, to, to take the, um, be the devil's advocate, so to speak, you know, being on their side, these young women, this is a cultural norm. It's a rite of passage um, and it is socially unacceptable to not have the procedure meaning they would dishonor their family. They may not be able to marry. They will be rejected by society. Um, and so these strong motivators um, allow this practice to be continued unquestionably, universally still continued. And these practices are motivated by local beliefs um, about what's considered acceptable sexual behavior, ensuring premarital virginity, ensuring marital fidelity, because it really hurts um, to, to have sex, especially with the type three. And then this propagation of the notion that girls are clean and beautiful after removal of their unclean body parts. Um, you know, several years ago, I, I saw a documentary at a, a conference about women from these areas where it's practiced and surveying them, they thought, you know, the American vulva and vagina was, was very ugly because it was very open. And they, they were taught to believe that, you know, having a very small opening was more clean and beautiful. Again, it's just, you know, programmatic thinking that they're taught these things. Um, and I've read before about this topic that if there is a dominant emotion involved for the family, it is of love. And we would, we would say, well, how, how are they loving their daughter by cutting her and harming her? But if they don't cut their daughter, then they're risking her entire future. Um, because again, the uncut girls ostracize, community members won't eat with her. They won't eat anything she's cooked. They won't accept water from her. They won't sit with her. She won't be able to get married. Um, and again, she's viewed as unclean and un unable to participate fully in the community. So it's these cultural um, the, and, and quote unquote religious, because there's no religion that actually condones these, but these um, areas need to need education so that they understand that there's actually no medical reason and that it can be harmful and what the harms are. Um, so that these local practices um, and religious leaders can support not cutting their young girls and women or you know, and young girls that this practice can cease to exist. Um, but again, religion is often cited as a reason and it is, not, it is not associated or condoned by any religious practice. But religious leaders in the area may support it. So sometimes I think that's where the confusion is um, in, re in regards to religion, that it is not condoned by any religion. Okay, so this makes me think of several things. First of all, why would you even want to get married. I mean, every bit of pleasure has been taken away. Uh, so, and the next question is, so she does get married and the pleasure has been taken away. He can, he can do whatever he wants at any given time, uh, because he has the power. Um, and she becomes pregnant. Can she really have a safe vaginal delivery? Yeah, and before I answer that question, I want to touch on something you said. So for the men, too, when they have this type 3, um, it actually is painful for them, too. They they can get cut and, and scraped. So they sometimes then don't even want to have any relationship, sexual relationship with their wife because it hurts. So there's so many reasons why this is not a good practice. But to get to your, to your point about vaginal delivery, um, so... The answer is, is yes, they can, but they have to be defibrillated. So um, again, vaginal delivery is always the safest mode of delivery for mom and baby as long as there's no other obstetric um, or maternal indication. But again, these women that have had the type three or the infibulation where the, the vulva has been sewn over the vagina, they need to have a procedure called de-infibulation to allow the baby to proceed through the birth canal. And this procedure, um, de-infibulation, is the practice of cutting open the sealed vaginal opening, um, which then exposes the vagina, the urethra, and sometimes 
exposes the clitoral glands if it wasn't previously removed. Um, I'll just make a note that if this is performed in the United States, we generally would always recommend this be done um, after epidural anesthesia so that the woman doesn't re-experience any, um, you know, or trigger any post-traumatic stress disorder from the initial cutting procedure um, and hopefully alleviate any pain that she has with um, the de-infibulation um, process. Um, but the procedure is um, almost always necessary if they've had that type three um, FGM to improve their health, their well-being, and then to allow for intercourse and to facilitate childbirth. Um, in the United States, it is illegal to uh, close the vagina again. So um, it, even if the, the partner and the, um, the patient are asking a provider to do that, it is illegal and the provider should say that it's illegal and um, hopefully not um, proceed with re-infibulation. Oh, what kind of treatment is available for women who have had FGM and also has, if they are even having sexual pain, is there treatment for these ladies? Yeah, and that's a really, really good question. And actually probably the highest um, highlight of this talk and this podcast is there's actually a lot of hope available for these women even if they've had type three um, resulting in, in sexual pain and severe vaginal narrowing, they're usually able to resume pain-free and pleasurable sexual activity after a defibrillation procedure. So this is the one study I could find um, in 2006 in the United States where 40 women with a history of the type, two, type three, which again is closing over the vagina, they underwent defibrillation and 100% were satisfied with their results with no intraoperative or postoperative complications. Um, and I'll just note that a lot of times in these women, the clitoral glands was either present or could be located. So, you know, I think um, initially the thought was with these um, patients that everything had been taken from them, but there's usually, um, still a large amount of the clitoral tissue that is available, even if the glands is removed. Um, a lot of times women will still have enough stimulation of the other clitoral components, the body, um, bulbs and cura to allow for um, sexual stimulation and pleasure. So um, I have taken care of these patients in the past and, um, and in my experience, most all were able to achieve orgasm after a defibrillation procedure. Um, just a note about Anesthesia, I would always recommend general anesthesia for these patients if it's not in relation to an obstetric or pregnancy um, related issue. And I would prefer this over regional anesthesia. Um, regional anesthesia we use commonly for pregnancy, that's an epidural, but um, for, for this type of patient who's coming in not pregnant, I would recommend general anesthesia. And just a note, local anesthesia should never be used um, because again, this could trigger um, PTSD. Um, and then lastly, just to reinforce that although the general structures can be restored to normal or near normal, there's still that emotional and psychological harm of these procedures that can still influence their mental and, and sexual functioning long-term. And these invisible scars, as you can imagine, are much more difficult to treat. And this is where we need to incorporate in other um, healthcare members of the team to help a woman work through um, any trauma that did um, exist. Dr. Caro, thank you so much for helping us better understand this topic. Uh, your insight and information, as always, is amazing. For more information on the Patty Brisbane Foundation for Women's Sexual Health and our six focuses, uh, visit the pattybrisbanefoundation.org. Remember, sex care is self-care and sexual health matters.